run into the most trouble with with folks. They're like, ah, I don't know if I want to open everything, and I'm like, okay, but I do. Yeah, oh, that's <laughs> good. So we've got the same culture, not a problem here. Yeah. <clears throat> that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like. <laughs> I always run into this thing where it's, you know, any effort that says we're going to change the world and transform the world towards regeneration and they're not open source, I mean, I kind of say, hey, that's a prerequisite for doing that kind of work, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so, it turns out somebody's arriving here in like half an hour, so I don't have all the time, but, but we can get a conversation started and then see if we can identify a way we can work together. Um, Sweet. Yeah. Well, um... So we're going to be building, uh, just to respond on our latest conversation, I was, so on the tractors, the hydraulics, I mean, we can teach you all about that. We're actually going to build, be building another track, a few tractors and a big one, uh, up to 144 horsepower, then another awesome. micro, micro tractor, which is just 16 horsepower. So I'm actually I'm using the micro tractor right now to do some of the grading around the sea go home site. So that's pretty cool. You know, it's like, it's really great to see the open source equipment, you know, coming together with open source products. So we're going to try to totally. release that as a, as a product that, that we can actually manufacture for others this year. I mean, we've been at it for some time, and yeah, it's, it's all coming together, so it's awesome. Yeah. Um, but then again, uh, I was going to ask you, like, maybe we could do, uh, you can teach me all I need to know about um, the, the power electronics that we're really looking for is with the solar off-grid systems, just to have a robust ability to do DC to DC and then DC to AC conversion from solar panels. Because sure. actually the new workshop we're building, it's going to be, it's going to have about 40 kilowatts of solar on top of it. And we didn't want to, like, if I could avoid it, I mean, we'll probably, we'll see what happens. But if we could avoid getting inverters off the shelf and actually make them so we can make them modular, scalable, and therefore we control them, you know, we, we run the technology, it doesn't break on us and we're stuck, you know? Sure. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, what do you so think? I did a bunch of legwork on that project, um, up to and including, um, I did a bit of a lit review. So I came across, um, I'm like, ah, okay, you know, I have all these ideas and I have, um, you know, I've written the firmware for 3D printers and laser cutters and things. So I have some idea of like the performance characteristics of these chips yeah. and what they're, what they're capable of, of managing. Uh -huh. And um, I have this sense that um, I, I should be able to build an inverter around an at mega, like yeah. 160 or something. Yeah. Um, so I, I go out looking for people who have done just that, and I run across an ECE 480 class at MSU, the university I worked at. Um, it was like two years before I was there. Um, uh, the, the class did exactly that. They All built right. a Arduino-based DC-DC uh, inverter and um, uh, wrote a firmware for it, uh, did all the, the legwork. Um, let me see, I what kind of power are we talking about? Is it simple? Uh, so, um, uh, their focus was on like uh, micro inversion, so their uh, proof of concept was a uh, thousand watt uh, mm -hmm. DC DC, and it, relatively small. Mm -hmm. uh, but the neat thing about their work is that they um, not only built the hardware and programmed it, they hooked it up to um, uh, industrial testing equipment and characterized the the sine wave uh, and the power coefficients and stuff that came out of it, and um, uh, it was totally reasonable. Yeah. Um, it, it made me, um, uh, I'm, I'm like, oh, okay, this is something that I can do and maybe won't fuck up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, do they use I, gate drivers or do they drive it directly, drive the transistors uh, directly? Uh, right. So um, uh, that becomes particularly uh, problematic on the high side. So um, if you have, um, if you're trying to drive like uh, 200 volts or something, Sure. Um, the high side transistors, the, the ones that are dealing with that, um, they have to be driven at a voltage that is at least as high as the voltage they're switching. Oh. This is my understanding. Oh, okay. So that's where the drivers come in. And they, um, they tend to have like built in um, um, uh, step up circuitry to handle that. <clears throat> so in my experience, it's useful. Um, I have a number of driver ICs that I have um, referenced for. Um, for power fats. Mm -hmm. I've done a bunch of research in power fats. Um, <clears throat> the circuit that I was kind of interested, so there's like, I've been down this rabbit hole on this particular problem. Um, when I drew out the, the circuit diagrams for an entire solar power system, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the first thing that was apparent to me was that um, all the transistors were in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. 
So when I look at that circuit diagram, there's um, a big giant transistor in the middle of the inverter, and all the power for the whole system has to flow through that transistor. And so of course it gets smoking hot. It has to be made of um, magic materials, like um, usually they're made of silicon carbide or some other uh, material. It's actually a worse transistor, but is able to handle a lot more heat. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, if I was to design that system as an electronic person... <clears throat> oh, hey, Ben. Ben. Hi. Ben Morrison. Ben, my... Hi, Ben. I'm Martian from Open Source Ecology. Yep. <laughs> oh, Martian. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Uh, we were just discussing um, uh, solar inverters and that kind of um, the research that's been done on that. Yeah, excellent. Um, so, <clears throat> with all those transistors in one spot, um, cooling becomes a huge issue. And further, um, uh, the sort of signaling you need to do with that transistor, um, you, you want to switch it at a frequency that's faster than um, audio. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, 100,000 hertz, and um, um, use capacitors and other um, techniques to smooth the sine wave that comes out of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's an extra problem for um, for that big honking transistor because um, transistors only make heat while they're being switched. So the the less often you can switch them, the better. Um, and further, the the amount of heat they make is directly related to how much you have to derate them. So um, in a typical application um, where I'm producing like an audio wave with a transistor, I would have to derate it by a factor of at least 10 um, because of heat. So if it's, if it's rated for 60 amps at 120 volts, I'm running it at 6 amps at 120 volts um, because it's going to make that much heat. So um, how do you reduce this and the um, the, the design um, principle at work is that the, the control device, the thing that's switching the power, should be as close to the thing that it's controlling as possible. So in this case, it's the solar panels or the solar cells or the, um, the battery cells themselves. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so yeah. ideally, each solar panel or each battery cell gets um, individual control transistors. And then the control problem is significantly more complicated. The software that's required um, uh, is more involved. But the control electronics systems that have appeared over the last 10, 15 years have become vastly more sophisticated. Um, it's, it's a heck of a lot easier for me to grab an FPGA, which has um, 500 pins, and program each individual one to control a transistor today than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. so, um, and that's the sort of control system that's needed for um, uh, an improvement over what exists today in black box stuff. If I um, go grab a black box um, charge controller, even if it does MPPT, I'm losing um, 10 to 20 percent of my power to transistor switching mm -hmm. and um, things like inductor losses. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but in the um, a sort of different architecture where um, the transistors are moved as close to the cells as possible. Um, we don't even need inductors. Um, the, the sort of losses that are incurred are much lower because the transistors have to switch much lower powers. So they can be um, uh, more efficient designs that switch faster and waste less power as heat because they don't have to be fancy um, silicon carbide. They can be um, high efficiency silicon. Mm -hmm. So, are um, these, so some, say the panels are on the roof, we would have the controller, say on the, you know, on the ground floor, you got a box there, that yep. kind of distance? That's okay, you're not, you're not talking about putting them right on the panels, like micro-inverters, are you? Well, um, so ideally, um, it, it, it's, it depends a lot on your, um, how, how crazy do we want to get, right? So, um, if you want... Replicable, crazy. Make it replicable, highly replicable. If you want the open source villages out there in the future that we're going to seed. Sure. If, if I want to drive the system to the, 
the most modular, lowest cost, highest efficiency possible. Mm -hmm. Like push it all the way, all the way up into the corner of that graph. Mm -hmm. Then, um, in order to to uh, that, I, I believe that's achievable with the circuit. Um, it's um, what that makes the circuit look like is um, it, it basically has to be touching the individual solar cells um, and the individual battery cells. So um, you, you do get to the point where you're talking per panel, per um, battery cell. And um, the connections in between um, uh, uh, matter a lot less. Um, uh, they can be, so the, the ultimate voltage of the system, like if you want the system to run at 600 volts or 200 volts or 80 volts, mm -hmm. that um, that has some determination on the sorts of transistors that are selected. But um, everything else about the circuit can be quite generic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you recommend? Would you recommend, like, the 200 figure sounds pretty good in that we can go directly to 240 AC or, like, a little under 600 because standard wires are rated for, like, 600, right? Sure. Um, a lot of panels max out around 600. Yeah. If you want to go directly to 240 AC, you have to be aware of the RMS voltage. So um, moving from DC to AC, um, so like 240 AC, the RMS is more like, um, I'm pulling numbers out of my head here, so um, they won't be 100%, but I, I think it's more like... I'm sorry? 320. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I don't know. It's around there. Um, close, yeah. <clears throat> so... Um, uh, that would be, you'd want to start as close to that voltage as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that sounds, really sounds good, like well within the error, you know, well, well within the 600. That might be a place to go for. Yeah. And it's, it's like a lot easier to step voltage down than it right. is up. I was going to say, the, the, the buck is easier than boost, right? Yeah. Simply although because it's like easier to go downhill. <laughs> Yeah, boost isn't that bad, but it's uh -huh. um, it involves an inductor, and that means um, yeah. you know a twenty percent loss give or take. Ah, uh, oh yeah. So with an inductor, you're always going to get like twenty percent loss or so. Yep. The way that I visualize inductors is that um, so it's it's a electromagnet, right? Yeah. And and you um, you're shoving power through it. Yeah. And um, as soon as you start shoving power through it, the magnetic field starts growing. Yeah. And then um, that magnetic field is like. Uh, it's what you're storing power in. You're, yeah. you're essentially, the, the inductor, half the inductor is the universe. <laughs> and it's the functional half. And we don't really know exactly how that thing works, but it seems to obey equations. So um, that magnetic field grows, and power is stored in it. And then as soon as you cut the power off, the magnetic field collapses. The way that I visualize it is as the field lines cross the, the coils of the inductor, mm -hmm. they induce um, an electric current, which is known as kickback, and the kickback happens so fast in a microsecond as the field collapses that the, um, the way that the boost works is that you build up the, the field slowly over time. Oh. Uh -oh. So, sorry, we're on over to power ourselves here at the switch. Okay. So, okay. Right. so so you build up the field slowly over time, like over uh -huh. seconds. And then you cut the switch and it yep. collapses over microseconds. And so um, what happens resistance is resistance that that through wires that happens or so um, the um, um, the the magnetic field induces a current fl that flows through the wires and because it happens so quickly compared to the amount of time you've put power into the system, the voltage is much higher. So the um, the what you get out of the inductive kickback is a relatively low amperage, high voltage um, uh, signal. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you're essentially shoveling power into the inductor slowly over time, and then it, it kicks it back out at you very quickly. And um, you exploit that phenomenon. You're um, constantly um, loading the inductor and then um, switching off power to it and allowing a diode to um, shunt the kickback into a capacitor. Mm -hmm. And and that's uh, how you attain the higher voltage. You, the higher voltage exists in that capacitor, and um, you average it over time. 
So depending on how fast you pulse the yeah. inductor, you get um, a different voltage off the other end. The loss comes from where? Diode? Resistance the loss comes wire. from um, the, the fundamental interaction between the, the inductor and the universe. It's um, there? So it's not even the resistance of... Uh, correct. So, um, wow. uh, part of it, so the, <clears throat> I can explain it. Um, typically inductors have, um, uh, uh, ferrite in the center of them, um, like a little bit of, of magnetic uh, metal. Yeah. And, um, when you start pushing power through the inductor, the ferrite, um, all of its molecules are misaligned. So as you start pushing power through the ferrite, all the molecule or, or through the electromagnet, the inductor, all the, the molecules in the ferrite start to align a little bit. Mm -hmm. they, they, they wiggle um, in order to align with the magnetic field of the inductor, mm -hmm. and that wiggling um, creates a bit of heat. Okay. And that's where the loss is. Okay. So the core, typically the core. So and and the reason that we use a core is um, that uh, the universe is really fucking fast. So when you power an inductor and then cut the power to it, that happens almost instantly. Um, the the curve, if you graph it, like it's on microseconds, and it, it just looks like a spike. You can't. There's. It's really difficult to use. So um, by by shoving an inductor in the middle of that electromagnet, it causes that curve to stretch out, mm -hmm. and um, there uh, a much larger portion of the curve becomes usable uh, by by a, a human, and. Um, the, the difference is really a time scale. So um, there's there's a thing called a, an air core inductor, which is literally just um, yeah. an electric coil without the ferrite part. Mm -hmm. And those are more efficient because um, there's no ferrite that is converting um, magnetic energy into heat energy. But they only work on like gigahertz uh, time scales. Okay. You have to pulse them very quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it becomes a control system problem. Mm -hmm. There's a, a dude at um, U of M who has built uh, a credit card size thousand watt inverter using air core um, uh, inductors, you know, mm -hmm. operating at the you know 200 megahertz or something. How efficient? Um, it's remarkably efficient, but um, uh, the trouble yeah. is that um, there's a trade-off. So the uh, operating with air core inductors allows you to skip the a large part of the inductor waste, but then you're switching transistors more often, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, the transistor burns power while it's trans. The transistor is an almost perfect um, conductor when it's engaged, and it's an mm -hmm. almost perfect resistor when it's um, disengaged. But as it's traveling between those two states, it is um, conducting and resisting, which means it's burning power. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the best you can do is to, um, like in this um, this different sort of circuit where the transistors are moved as close to the, the, the battery cells and as close to the solar cells as possible, in that circuit, um, each transistor is switching less power, which means that you can get away with using um, essentially magic transistors, transistors that switch in, in, in the nanosecond time scale and um, operate in the like the high nines nine nine point nine nine efficiency oh wow okay. um the the thing about that is that um the reason that you can get away with that in that architecture is that you're using a lot of them and yeah. they're physically distant from each other so that what heat they do produce isn't concentrated mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um uh also in that architecture you're switching the transistors a lot less frequently because, um, okay, so another way that I can sort of explain it and try to visualize it is that um, when you're dealing with these power systems, um, it seems like at some point, okay, so um, there's two types of power loads, right? There's resistive and inductive. And um, every motor is inductive. Every computer is resistive. Every light bulb is resistive. So, um, inductive loads are hell on your inverter because um, uh, the moment that you flip the switch on them, right, you contact um, the power and electrons start to flow, um, there's an electrical coil in there, which again is um, it's engaging with the universe as part of its functional um, state. 
So um, when you connect the power to that, it's uh, if you have like a multimeter or, or um, a simulator, and you can ask that simulator what um, what the current draw on that circuit is. Mm -hmm. The moment that you connect to the power, the current draw is infinite for yeah. an infinitely small amount of time. Yeah. And um, during that infinitely small amount of time, um, uh, the power electronics, the inverter, has this um, much higher load than it's, t than it's used to experiencing. Yeah. Um, so inductive loads require the inverter to be built uh, quite a lot heavier duty than um, the same resistive load. Mm. Like a, a, I would expect to need um, a 4,000 watt inverter to drive a 2,000 watt motor. Um, when a 2,000 watt inverter would drive a 2,000 watt computer. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that initial brief infinite power spike is really difficult to deal with. And um, uh, where am I going with this? Oh, because, so um, in, in, this, in this other it, architecture. Because, OK, average power is small, but the, the thing about the high spikes, all the interference that comes with it, or what? What's the problem there? Um, it's uh, it's not just interference. It's um, uh, so that high spike will um, it's it's more prone to tripping things like um, yeah oh yeah like GFCs. fuses, PTCs, um, uh, overheating things yeah. that um, yeah okay so that's the major major issue and then. Um, mm. Uh, the bit of the universe that you're working with there is the inductor. You have to charge up the inductor enough. There has to be enough copper. There has to be enough mag magnetism there um, to deal with the sort of power draw. Mm -hmm. And those things are all expensive. Uh, copper's expensive. It's bulky. Um, there, it makes a lot of heat. There's all kinds of problems with it. So um, in this other architecture where the transistors moved out as close to the cells as possible, the bit of the universe that is engaged um, is the chemical reaction inside the battery. So um, it's this architecture is inductorless. Rather than inductors, um, the the battery cell itself is plugged directly in circuit and um, absorbs the brunt of the uh, that initial spike, that initial power spike. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Uh, so the system still um, experiences this like um, differential load, but the, um, instead of uh, kind of ramming into uh, a circuit like a buck or a boost where it has to be converted and that circuit has to be built um, heavy duty in order to do the, the conversion, it rams into the, the chemicals in the battery cell itself. And those things are quite a lot more durable. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that that kind of architecture eliminates a lot of um, uh, difficulty in terms of max power load because um, that tends to be limited by the inductors. Um, the cells are actually the battery cells are capable of ridiculous loads. Usually, um, you know, a single power tool eighteen six fifty can do thirty amps. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, it, it's really shocking how much batteries you up with if you can feed it to them. Yeah. How much of the circuit is open source and available like right now? Is there a lot of development to be done here? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I work with um, the folks at Ultimachine. Yeah. Um, they have been developing um, an open source controller. Uh, I can link you to it. Mm -hmm. It is called... Um, Oh, um, let me get it up here. Uh, so their controller, um, <clears throat> they've been working for quite a while to um, build the basic circuits that are required um, for all of this stuff. They're all the same circuits as um, everything else already uses. So um, this is a neat thing about this architecture. When you um, get down to this level, so what is what is an inverter? <clears throat> it's um, you want to see the link through the chat box there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just um, let me grab it here. Um, 
I can't remember the name for it. Oh, where I put the link. The other controllers. Okay. Right, of course. There we go. Okay, so um, once you get to this level, all of these circuits look like age bridges. Um, what do you need? Uh, uh, so, um, an inverter will produce different phases of power, like 110 volt um, single phase, or um, 220 two phase, um, 443 phase, things like this. Um, each phase is its own sine wave, um, which, as, as you mentioned, you have to deal with the RMS voltage of. Um, uh, in order to synchronize the phases, you need to be able to test amperage and voltage between them. So between each phase, you need um, a sense line that uh, allows you to compare the amperage and voltage between um, each phase so that you can tell which, which part of the curve you're in. And then, um, uh, so once you have an H bridge to generate uh, a sine wave, and once you have the sense uh, circuits to gen to tell amperage and voltage between the phases. Um, you're just doing motor control. It's just a standard H bridge that is producing a sine wave at 60 hertz or 50 hertz, depending on where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, that is uh, synchronized with two other sine waves or, or one other sine wave that um, you're also generating. So this is actually a really simple case as far as motor controllers go. Most motor controllers operate at a lot of different frequencies, not just one. So it's it's um, a single frequency, like a single speed motor controller, and it's um, not that complicated. So we went from from Arduino based inverters to RAP cores. So RAP cores is uh, this is uh, uh, the state of the art in mm -hmm. rep RAP electronics. So Johnny, um, he's the person who developed the ramps yeah. electronics. Yeah. Um, so these, these are the same folks. Um, Johnny uh, Tonikip, uh, who wrote um, one of the first firmwares for RepRap. Um, they're all working on um, uh, this FPGA-based controller at this point. So they've, um, they've done a bunch of different rounds of development. They have received their first test ASIC um, that, that just came to the mail like last week. And um, uh, what they're doing is so in a, in a like rep rep controller, um, the most expensive bill of materials item is the stepper driver IC. Mm -hmm. You need five of them, and they're like three to ten dollars each, which for a hundred dollar board is a lot of money. So, mm -hmm. um, and they're also full of secret sauce. Um, so they've been reverse engineering them oh. and re implementing the algorithms from scratch in this FPGA. Wow. So that they can take those chips off the BOM. Wow, that's pretty good. Um, uh, how, how expensive is this thing? Is, is this going to be affordable? Like safer than inverter? So um, the FPGA chip itself is available in single unit quantities for like ten bucks. Mm -hmm. So the oh, board cool. based on it is going to be reasonable. It'll be like a three D printer controller. Um, the the oh. difference is that. Um, the board they're targeting initially has eight axes, so that's eight full H bridges, which means that um, in an inverter context, like if it was souped up to handle the right voltage, um, it would be able to do eight different phases simultaneously. And um, to me, this means like um, uh, four, like, like um, four, four wheels on a, like a, an individually. Uh, driven electric vehicle, and then four more channels for like um, three phase power plus one ten or something. Hmm. Um, yeah, like, you could do interesting things with it. Yeah. Um, this sort of circuit, if you have a full H bridge with um, the ability to sense amperage and voltage between phases, that's also the same circuit as um, a TIG welder. It's the same circuit as um, 
oh, um, well, like we said, any any motor controller, any inverter. Um, uh, yeah. um, how, what else do you have to do to get an induction furnace power supply? <laughs> well, um, again, like um, same same circuit. Um, uh, dealing but with the inductor, but some capacitors, adding some more capacitors, or um, we're getting a little. I mean, no, no, let me think about it a second. Uh, you shouldn't absolutely need capacitors to drive um, like an inductive furnace. They will help. Um, uh, for instance, like they can be on the other side of a, a boost circuit and allow you to dump more power through that um, through the inductor. But um, as long as the control is like a solid state inductor driver shouldn't be difficult. That, that doesn't require large capacitors. You, you get in things like um, VFDs, like um, a variable frequency drive, where you're you're um, taking in 110 and putting out 220 at a different frequency, or you're you're taking in um, 220 and putting out 440 at a different frequency. Those things use large capacitor banks, and the capacitor banks in them are considered disposable mm -hmm. because you're you're charging and discharging them at more than 60 hertz at their full rated capacity for the entire time the thing is on. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we're actually getting into the the, um, the area where supercapacitors and ultracapacitors are starting to be um, attractive for this sort of thing. Um, they're they're not quite as dense as um, as battery cells, but like compared to a disposable electrolytic in a BFD, um, it would be a, a, a neat option. It'd be more durable for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, what's the state of, um, as far as the, the RAP course? Okay, so my understanding is that um, I try to keep up with these guys. Um, they are, they just sampled their first ASIC. Um, they have been through a bunch of rounds of testing. Um, the stepper driver circuitry is there and functional. Um, they even have some auditor feedback, so they're able to do things like servo control. Um, the, the FPGA, it's really state-of-the-art work. The, the FPGA that they're using, the ECP-5, is the largest FPGA that's currently supported by free software. And... Um, uh, is that FPGA also... It's not open hardware, is it? It's been reverse engineered. So the, um, the, the fellow who wrote, um, or one of the major contributors to OpenSCAD, yeah. also is a major contributor to ICE Tools. Which is the reverse engineered FPGA development tool chain. Um, it started off supporting the ICE 40 series FPGAs from, um, uh, I forget the, the lattice, I think. And uh, uh, now it supports um, a number of FPGAs from different manufacturers. The ECP5 is the largest, it has um, 85,000 gates in its largest configuration and runs up to 2 gigahertz. Has things like Gigabit Ethernet and HDMI built in. Um, That's Clifford Wolf. Correct. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's it's uh, been reverse engineered. So in other words, like if we go to a fab, to some kind of a fab place, we can get that manufactured open source hardware. Absolutely. And what so. You can use, well, I mean, Alta Machine are, are the, the folks who are pushing this um, farthest, fastest at the moment. Mm, wow. Um, they have used this tool chain and the, the ECP5 development boards that they've designed and built to um, produce the VHDL, the net lists, the, um, the tape out for this custom ASIC that they're just, it's just arriving. So uh, when they did that, uh, that means that design is out there and it's open. Yep. And you can take it to also to another fab place that will could also make it for you. Hundred percent. And um, my understanding, That's you know, this isn't the first chip I've been involved in. Um, I was involved in the Open Graphics Project and, and other um, chip design efforts. Uh, my understanding is that technologies that are not that old, like um, thirty-five nanometer. Is uh, you can get a, a reasonable like a, a run of chips taped and produced for like ten grand. 
it's you know it's not going to be the latest process mm -hmm. but 35 nanometers fine you know I, I was happy with that 10 years ago yeah <laughs> wow um yeah so i mean practically speaking um well if we want to get an inverter to, to work on our system here what would you suggest right now because i mean it sounds like there's some development happening there so probably like a year or two totally in the future what especially for high amperage and high wattage um situations um well, I mean, just simple Arduino-based stuff. Like, I mean, you know. Are you familiar with the? I'm sure that you've seen the Electrodacus um, charge controllers. No. What is it called? Electrodacus. Um, D A C U S. They they take sort of a different approach. Um, they're they're architected differently than most. They're not actually MPPT at all. They're um. They use a simpler algorithm, um, which is, is not quite as efficient, but it's like 1% less efficient. And then instead of transistors, and instead of switching, um, uh, attempting to like buck or boost the power, it uses remote relays. So um, uh, those remote relays are able to switch in high loads. And it's not the inverter part, but it's just the charge controller part. But because of that architecture using the remote relays, the, the actual charge controller circuitry is not the limit for how much power it can handle. It's the remote relays that are the limit. Oh, wow. So Electrodacus, <laughs> that's already out there in open source. Correct. So should we be using that? Uh, it's um, one of the more advanced options that's open source at the moment. Huh. So, Again, uh, he's the algorithm, algorithm is all open source, yeah? Yeah, it's, uh, like I say, it's not MPT, um, but it's, um, for, so in other words, he's, he's made choices, he's made trade-offs, it's not a perfect system, but it is um, quite well engineered for what it is, and the trade-offs that he's made are appropriate for like a, a large system, for like 40 kilowatt system. So that's the charge control part, and what about the inversion part? Um, the inversion part is a little more complicated. Um, Does that take really us back bad. to the, the project you said at MCU? Yeah, there's there's just less. Um, there's been less progress in the open on the inversion part. So where I can point you to Electrodacus today, I can't point you to a high wattage open inverter today. Um, uh, the architecture is well understood, and the the circuits are not that complicated. Like, if I go to buy, um, like, I can go to AliExpress and find all kinds of Arduino based inverters. They exist. They'll, um, they do? you can reprogram them. Are they um, not, not perfectly open, right? They're not open designs, right? Yeah. Hmm. Um, there are a lot of, of um, China inverters out there that have, like, a, a generic, um, like, a, an ESP8266. Wi-Fi um, or Bluetooth and um, those are pretty hackable but still in that not exactly open space mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well what do you think about the, MC the MCU project then um, is that is that something worth replicating or well um, or so rep cores like um, where I sit with it is this um, it's I see it as the next generation 3D printer controller mm -hmm. um, the, the ultimate machine folks are interested in other um, applications so when I talked to them last they were excited about a farm robot they were like oh hey we see you're doing some things with hydraulics and um, we don't know much about those control systems and we would like our controller to be able to handle them um, are you interested in working on this sort of stuff with us? Mm -hmm. um, to which I'm like, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that they will probably have that controller in a functional state for controlling things like 3D printers and industrial robots in you know in the next year. Um, they're at point three. They've been working on it for about a year. Um, it's pretty functional. 
So I think that they'll be, um, you know, approaching bug free or as close as you can get to that. Um, you're pretty within the year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of, so then at that point, the circuit works for something like a 3d printer, um, in electrically, it's um, exactly what you need for any sort of motor control or inversion job, mm -hmm. um, other, other than the maximum voltage that it can support. So it's possible for like a, a, a 220 inverter, it's likely that we'd have to do a custom board spin, something that has higher voltage transistors, um, um, resistor networks that divide the 220 voltage down to something the MCU can sense, so on and so forth. Um, uh, it would be a minor adjustment to the board. It would be um, a different production run. Um, there would be some cost in that, but not a lot. The, the largest cost that I see is in the software development side. I think that um, developing the, even, even with the circuit existing, and even with the basic firmware existing, and even with example like the, the ECE 480 paper that's in the wiki um, uh, on that open um, controller, even with existing work like that, um, I think that it's um, it would take a, a development team like Ultimachine or like um, Replimat um, six months or a year to, to hack out the inverter firmware right. for it. So I'm saying, and then, but how usable is it by, you know, like Arduino style that you can now, that anyone can do it at the point the firmware is developed, then it becomes highly usable by people to do their own applications? Totally. Yeah. I mean, once, once the work is done once, it can be copied yeah. a million times. Yeah. Um, I, I see the circuit in my head. Um, I, I haven't gotten to the point of sitting down and attempting to draw it. Mm -hmm. um, the circuit in the Ultimachine machine board is really close. Um, yeah. they, they have almost everything there. The, the one thing that they don't have is current and voltage sensing between the phases. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about adding that. Um, uh, that. The board doesn't need it for 3D printer control because um, each phase is, is basically a different stepper and they're not, um, it doesn't have to synchronize between them quite that closely. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, here's the, um, this is the existing uh, uh, compact DC-DC inverter project. See. Um, so I, I, I don't see a lot of effort that has to be done on the circuit side. I mean, they're basically putting in all that effort um, up front because it um, it addresses the existing motor control issues that they're working on. But um, the additional firmware and software development would be something that, like, um, uh, we'd have to be able to take care of a software developer for the amount of time it, it took to, to come up with that. Yeah. Uh, these guys exist too. Um, I have a lot of links for. Um, guys. Yeah. 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 Yeah, what I was looking yeah. for is like this is a simple application of Arduino, just Arduino Mega style, plus some transistors and a simple board. At this point, where you know anyone can play with it, um, do you have interest in putting out something like that too, or that's that's too too pedestrian at this time? Um, uh, like a generic inverter board. Yeah. Um, I would love to see something like that. Um. Uh, I would love to see um, this ultra generic board. Like, um, um, I, I sort of imagine in my head this this thing. Um, like there's not a name for it. It's sort of you know, it's like mashing together the motor controller and the, and the BMS. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, oh my gosh, the tricks that it's capable of. Okay, 
So um, this circuit, if you were to build it, um, the, the distributed um, transistor circuit, um, you could do, there's a trick called um, active rectification. Mm -hmm. um, it's often used in power supplies because um, diodes have a voltage drop. And if you use diodes to rectify power, you experience the voltage drop. Um, so if, if there's a thousand watts going across it and it's dropping a volt, um, and it's only at 12 volts, and then that's almost 10% that you're losing in terms of heat at the diode. So um, uh, power supplies often use active rectification, which allows them to achieve a higher efficiency. So um, active rectification at 60 hertz is really easy to pull off because um, the, the power is doing this thing at 60 times a second, and your MCU is running at 60 megahertz, or um, in the case of an FPGA at 2 gigahertz. So you get to sit there and watch the voltage as it crosses the zero line 60 times a second, um, like it's moving in slow motion, because um, mm -hmm. you could do 60 million calculations a second. So um, it's really easy to sit at um, an H bridge and um, switch the H bridge, you know, this half's open, close it, this half's open, close it, as the sine wave is doing this thing, um, so that um, it's always, you know, when, when the power is in the, the negative space, you've um, configured the H-bridge so that you're, um, you're connecting that wire to the negative terminal of the battery. When the power's on the positive side, you're, you're configuring the H-bridge so that you're connecting it to the positive terminal of the battery. So that um, even if you plug this, this battery with controller thing directly into a, a 110 wall, it could charge itself because it has the ability to sense voltage and amperage across phases. It has the ability, it has H-bridge. So it can do active rectification as long as it has the software support for it. Um, it's, it's just the reverse of controlling a motor. Um, so as long as the, the software was generic enough, the circuit completely allows the power to flow in either direction at full amperage and full voltage because there's no inductor or capacitor or buck or boost circuit in the way. Mm -hmm. um, that's a neat trick to be able to charge off AC directly. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> interesting. Um, a question for a simple generic Arduino-based inverter: From 120 DC, do you readily get without boost to 240 because you're just sw switching opposite, like you're doubling the 120, or or no? That's you don't get 240 Not quite. AC. Um, yeah, no, you'd need, um... You'd need 240 for that? Uh, like, um, I think, I, when I did the math, it was like 174 volts or something like that that I would need to, to get 120. Yeah. Um, uh... With, with different phases, um, a little more can be done, but, uh... Yeah, you, you need a, a, a significantly higher voltage than the one that you are attempting to achieve, either at the cells or mm -hmm. at the panels, um, um, in some way. Yeah. Um, or, or you'll be limited by the, um, the amp capacity of the boost circuit. So it's, it's always possible to boost, but... Um, um, the inductor is the limiting factor there. So the, the size of the inductor limits how large a magnetic field you can grow, which limits the um, the volume of electrons in the kickback. Okay. Um, so I've got a, another question for you, a different one, regarding the concept of distributed enterprise. Sure. Um, have you read that word on our wiki? Uh, well, um, a little bit. And I'm... Um, so do you get it? The idea, yeah, that, so. the idea that, okay, there's an enterprise and we're actively helping others achieve that enterprise because uh, the movement swells, it grows, it becomes better, uh, like software has. I mean, that's no-brainer. But the idea that, that uh, I don't know of any single one who's act any single entity that's trying to do that outside of ourselves, in other words, actively encouraging enterprise on the, the open hardware, so p publishing both open hardware and open enterprise models. Uh, so uh, my experience with RepRap was really interesting and informative to me. Um, we, I showed up in that project, um, like number 20, 
person show up and say, hey, this is a good idea. Um, uh, I got to see, like, from from being person number 20 to being, I sort of mustered out of the project when uh, there was, like, 10,000 people because um, it was it got very, like, there's a lot going on. Um, and I got deep into the weeds in what I was doing. So um, from that, like, 20 to 10,000 people period, I saw about 300 different startups um, start and many fail, um, but some succeed. And it includes like MakerBot and Ultimachine and Ultimaker and others. Um, it was really interesting. Um, we at RepRap, um, in the early days, Zach Hoken tried really hard to um, make the not-for-profit model work. Like um, he, he started the RepRap Research Foundation um, all of us hackers like pitched in money, you know, throwing hundred dollar bills at him. Um, I don't have much. But here, take this. And um, he was putting in bulk orders for all the electronics, the PCBs, um, distributing them out basically at cost to all the developers. And um, he got kind of burnt out on it. And we're like, dude, are, are you making any money? No. Oh, okay, there's your problem. Um, so as soon as folks stepped in and started. Um, and introduced a bit of a profit motive, you know, um, had, were making enough money to feed themselves in addition to hack on the project, things started happening. Um, it was critical that people be able to um, spend their full-time effort on it and not have to worry about where the money was coming from. Once that happened, um, it really unlocked and unleashed the development effort. So, um, the enterprise part of it, uh, it's real, real important to me. Um, uh, I understand how critical it is to uh, achieving sustainability and um, um, a place in which the effort put into these sorts of things can be um, maintained and not just, um, you know, where it's a marathon, not a sprint. Okay, but where's where's all these because where's all these people now that okay they do a successful enterprise and I'm trying to replicate that. That's what I mean by distributed enterprise. So yeah, you work it out, but you don't go in a corner, and then this is your enterprise. But distributed that means distrib truly distributed enterprise that you actually promote and train others to do that enterprise. Sure. Uh, and then we go further to to evoke the word called distributed market substitution which means that any product should undergo this thing where it actually gets better than anything else and kind of dominates the market. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm seeing some of that in like um, the Precious Plastics Bazaar. Are you familiar with those guys? Yeah. Um, so they have they have their own where? little kind of eBay for, um, for their stuff. But where? I mean, um, where somebody succeeds in an enterprise and help, tries to help others to replicate it? Um, what, so, like, the the way that they're doing it is um, that they're distributing, like, um, um, uh, a pamphlet or a starter kit. Like, you download a zip file that has business plans and, and other things in it in addition to all the other stuff for the project. I don't know that they're teaching yeah, classes. I see, or, I, see. That, I guess that's the closest. I, I do appreciate that's the closest. The last I checked, it was kind of a... Uh, was one thing missing, and that was yeah. They they've been <laughs> kind of vocal about the fact that they didn't do as good of a job with the business plan part of it as they could have. In the past. Well, I, I think the the very critical missing thing is a highly evolved product. Yes, you, you can have the production infrastructure, but what is one particular business model or product that you can sell and say, okay, here's your revenue model. Now others yeah, yeah. go ahead. You can replicate this. Right. So a product would help. One hundred percent. Totally. <laughs> that's, yeah. yeah. Um, that's, that's the nut we're trying to crack. And in a more general sense, it's about, um, I still think we have to, like for a specific product development, because, okay, because Rap Rap was this wild thing, uh, chaotic thing, that, and then a bunch of stuff came out of it, Yeah. and most of it became closed. A lot of it. Right. Um, so that part, that promise of, okay, now we can distribute that enterprise has not happened. So we're saying, okay, we still have to solve this issue of open source hardware where you get enough developers showing up uh, f 
from various enterprises, from various like people just coming together and saying, okay, we're going to do this enterprise, but we're not going to centralize it. We're going to say, okay, we all get the benefit of that enterprise. So that part I have not seen. Um, I think that's a, that's a thing to solve for in the history of how open hardware or the open economy transition happens, which in my sure. view is pretty inevitable. I think a big part of it for me, um, a, a big missing piece in a lot of things that I've run into is modularity. Yeah. Um, which is, is why Reflamat and, yeah. and Gridbeam and Open Source College are important to me. Um, yeah. Mo that modularity to me is like, um, you got it. You know, we, we work at Reflamat a lot with frame, with this yeah. um, aluminum extrusion. And to me, it's it's both a literal and a figurative framework. It's, yeah. it's like the framework within which we cooperate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, definitely, definitely. Um, I'm really excited about this um, this possibility of, of developing products that have um, a revenue stream associated with them, that have markets attached to them, where people are already aware that this is a thing that exists and mm -hmm. are looking for it. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of ways in which the systems that we work with can um, facilitate both the development aspect of that and the production and sale of that. Yeah. Um, I think it makes sense for us to, for like multiple people to manufacture this stuff. It makes sense to have local yeah. suppliers. Um, uh, there's a lot of reasons why it's uh, beneficial for us to work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say like, just like the modular technology and the, the module enterprise, all the assets that go into that and create modules around that. That's exactly what we're trying to do with the apprenticeship, um, with the CEPA home being a product. So we're saying, okay, hey, here's something that somebody might want, a house that's producible at the lowest possible cost, that's most effective. So yeah, we'll see um, how that goes, but that's that's kind of like, that came out of COVID uh, break. I came, okay, let's, let's try this very important product that combines a lot of our work of what we've worked on before already and turns into something that people understand it and we can get a lot of interest behind. Yeah. Um, can I ask, um, yeah. like, I, I see that you've done some work with, like, um, 3D printer build um, yeah. sessions. Is yeah. um, what, um, I'm curious, sort of, like, what, what you get the most response from out of the stuff that you do? What, what are people most excited about? Uh, I think the, the, the part that sticks out to me is when people come in and they, they appreciate that they can actually build these things. So there's a little aha moment that comes out of the 3D printer or the brick press or tractor that you build over a weekend, which is crazy unfathomable and not done anywhere else in the world. So I think that's the, that's the biggest thing, just, just shaking up the myths of human limits and that we all can learn these things and, and if we collaborate, we can actually make this a viable economic system, an economic model. So we envision, that kind of goes towards this idea of the, the yet undelivered open source micro factory, where of course the global repository of design feeds advanced production facilities that are spread throughout the world. So that's the promise undelivered by the Fab Labs or anything else. Um, yeah. that, that thing is, um, I think, kind of response from people hints that that is quite possible and quite desirable as people are gaining back their skills and, and that that essential human thing of being productive and if you can change your environment you, sh you think differently about economics and politics you get on top of that too you know change the economy yep. change you know change the eco economics and politics so that's you know whoever talks about regenerating the earth you gotta talk about hey what are people consuming yeah let's address that through distributed cyclic material flows yeah uh, so um, can, I, can I ask? I'm curious um, about so like one of the things that I've been I've been working since RepRap for ten years yeah. to reduce um, my my footprint and the amount of bills that I pay. Yeah. And um, like I own my home, um, so that I can hack on these projects sustainably. Yeah. Um, can, can I talk about um, or ask about um, um, your revenue stream? Like what what does the economics of open source ecology look like? 
The revenue stream is running workshops and producing 3D printers or brick presses for sale. So it's product sales and education. Okay. We're combining the two. We're, we're actually saying, hey, you can actually produce a viable product during a workshop. So we're actually capturing the revenue stream of, of one education and two, the actual product sale. And we invite the, the customer to that events typically. Yeah. Um, one of the things, one of the, the approaches that we've considered is like, um, um, you know, build, building with our product is really fun and um, uh, it happens quickly mm -hmm. and um, it's rewarding, like you're talking about. So, um, the, uh, the, the, well, so Replimat um, is this, so for me, it's kind of grown out of um, um, when I was working on the 3D printers, I was focused on this problem of bootstrapping. Yeah. I want a 3D printer, I don't have a 3D printer, how do I build a 3D printer? Mm -hmm. um, so I looked at all these rapid prototyping systems and I found the one that was um, easiest to make at home. And uh, that's what's become the framing system for Replimat. Um, so it's, it's based largely around Gridbeam, um, which is based on a system called Matrix, which is based on a way of building um, crates that was developed in the 20s um, and maybe before then. And um, we've added our own refinements to it. And then um, uh, all the other parts that go around it, things uh, uh, like generic pumps and wheels and, and bearings and adapter plates and things. How many parts so, in there? So you've got like a package kit? Or, or correct. You, uh, um, so we to that specifically? Yeah, yeah. Is that something um, you actually sell? Or? So we're, um, we're gearing up for, um, we're taking pre-orders on the 26th. Page here. Um, so here's the store. Um, it's still a little rough until we launch, uh, but um, you'll get the idea. Um, we have um, several kits that we've developed. Um, there's a kit for structure, so you have to build a frame for a thing. There's all the parts for that. There's a kit for making that thing move around on wheels mm -hmm. um, with power systems. Um, there's a kit for uh, machines, like a linear motion uh, kit. Um, so if you want to build a 3D printer or a CNC router, that's the kit. Um, there's a kit for fluids and for electrics. Let's see. Uh, so we're still working on some of the renders, um, uh, you know, 26th is launch day. <laughs> so I see like, uh, so what you just mentioned right now, that's not there. I see the structure kit and stuff like right, that. Right, the structure kit. Um, the other ones are in there, but they're private at the moment. Okay. Um, we have, if you look at the wiki, the categories in the wiki are roughly what the kit will be. So the, the wiki is, is divided into structures, motions, electrics, fluids, hydraulics, pneumatics. Are you positioning them as, okay, here's explicit products you can build with them with good case examples, or this is kind of like... So, um, like? Replimat is, uh, for me, There's I've done a lot of software development on it. So, um, we have this wonderful CAD system. It's built around this library, Nopscad Lib, um, which a decade of work has gone into. Um, so, all, all Replimat parts are Nopscad Lib parts. Everything drawn in Nopscad Lib um, gets things like exploded diagrams, assembly instructions, bills of material for free. Mm -hmm. So um, we have built, I have built the infrastructure such that um, when, a, when a user comes along to our wiki and submits uh, a thing that they've designed, the wiki has hooks built in to um, run that design through um, all of our infrastructure to pull all that information out so that um, uh, any person who comes along and checks the design into Git gets the same benefits. So that um, all, all we need is to draw the design in CAD, and we get all of the metadata, all the assembly instructions, everything else generated automatically. And um, uh, part of that is that when um, we get to reverse all that data. So um, we get to walk through every project in the wiki and ask you know, interrogate that project, what parts do you use? Well, I need five 
um, five segment frames, and I need 10, 10 segment frames, and I need three 15 segment frames, and I need this many nuts and bolts. So we can tally up that information for every single project in the wiki, and then reverse, okay, I have these parts, what projects can I build? Um, uh, a big part of RepliMap is being able to ask questions like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, simplifying yeah. The, the system and making it mo this level of modular um, means that the computer has about as much understanding of it as we do, um, which is really nice. There, there's not many building systems that are like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Potential is great. Like, I would. I would suggest things like here's some very powerful, important things that you can build with it. I mean, what's do you have a case of something like that? Okay, here's a, an amazing product you can build with this right now. So, um, yeah, we have um, uh, a bunch of stuff in the wiki, like um, we have basics like furniture. Um, um, the One of the killer products for me is a cargo cycle. So we have a, a bunch of development in the various cargo cycles. Um, there's a group called N55 in Copenhagen. I'm not sure if you're aware of them. Not open source. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Uh, but uh, uh, they, they have published a lot of photos and things, yeah. so a lot of information is reversible. Um, I've you, contacted so you, member, members of them, like Tobias, Vick, um, who built their, um, I don't know if you've seen, they built a, a frame drilling machine out of frame, which is awesome. Um, I haven't seen that. Um, yeah, cargo bikes. I mean, maybe we could collaborate on some uh, light light vehicles. I mean, for, in our set, we've got the car, the micro car, things like that. So that would be highly interesting. And imagine that, like, uh, electric motor, open source electric motors that are highly three D printable, things like that. Totally. Um, for me, the motorcycle means um, it's a, it's transportation that yeah. doesn't require a driver's license or insurance, and it's also a potential job. Absolutely. Um. um uh -huh. Where are you at on any uh, electric motor development? That's one of the tools, uh, the 50 Global Village construction set tools. Sure. Um, so Christoph Lamer, have, have you seen his work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, I've been paying attention to him. There's a couple other um, other folks on YouTube who are doing similar, um, uh, like, um, 3D printed uh, cycloidal motors or, or other styles of motors that are useful for different actuators. Um, uh, yeah, it's huge potential, yeah, huge potential. I honestly think Christoph's motor is good enough. Like, it's, it's good enough to start with. It's a, a 500 horse, um, three phase. But that one, like, that one's not, I mean, uh, not exactly open source, right? The, the low power one yeah. is, so what do we do about that? Just reverse engineer it or? Totally. Um, it's, it's not that complicated. Um, um yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that's already there. Now, I was thinking that instead of that design, just simple axial flux, much simpler design, right? Um, sure. Uh, so um, you get into interesting issues with motor design. Um, you're like, you're, you're uh, versed in motor design, too? A bit. Um, um, so like Christoph's design uses um, permanent magnets in a hallback array. And yeah. um, the, the permanent magnets are a thing. Like in Replimap, I play this game of trying to build things with as few vitamins as possible. Okay, hold on. A second. Let me just uh, guess. Hold on, I'm just checking on it. I'll, uh, I'll be right back too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Still on the call. Hang on. Seeing mommy wrap up and mommy. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, the guest is here, so I kind of got to start wrapping up, but I was... Uh, uh, Tim jumped up, too. Okay. Uh, ben, what what do you do? What... Well, that uh, I've been Tim's best friend for ages now. Um, mm -hmm. I've been along him this whole way. I've been kind of managing the commercial side of things, uh, getting the website together, uh, building our email server, getting some of our social media stuff together. Um, I, I've been working on like a logo and some of the artwork and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I I've uh, um, I've taken part in building some of these three D printers. Um, I've inherited some of his uh, his older printers and I've been um, putting new electronics on them. Um, 
uh, and printing new parts for them, you know, having fun with that and learning a lot this whole way. I, um, I come from an IT background. I lost my job in, uh, uh, through COVID. And while well, now I'm kind of here, uh, well, full time with Replimat. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I got to get, get going, going here on my side. Yeah, though. Oh, sorry about that. Here's Tim, too, to Tim. say goodbye. Yeah, Tim, Tim, I kind of got to get going because the guests, <laughs> guests are right. But, <laughs> but let's see, I mean, what, what can we work together on and, and under the distributed enterprise aspect of sharing the different technologies? So we right now, I mean, we produce a 3D printer, the which, which actually uh, we claim is the simplest printer in the world by virtue of part count. Uh, we've got the compressed earth block press, the house that we're re releasing. So a house, a $50,000, 1,000 square foot house, that's completely engineered and so forth. Uh, so yeah, if we, can, if we can share designs and make this the, the dream that sure. shall be realized come true. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm so excited just to be um, in communication and yeah. talking, and um, let's just keep that flowing and yeah. keep each other moving. And let's see if we can take like one very specific thing. Like I don't know if it could be the simple Arduino. Don't don't worry about the FPGA route. I mean, maybe if we can hit the simple one. Uh, that in itself, it, I mean, any one of these products that's a million, multi-million dollar business, I'm not sure it's a billion dollar business. We typically like to operate in things that are at least like billion dollar scale things. But sure. the inverters are multi-million dollar, like just, just the simple stuff that can be done with Arduino, that, that can be quite a product itself. Something that's neat about the electronic side of this is that, um, I, I mean, so let me, um, if you have one minute, I'll send a video. Um, okay. You don't have to watch it right now, but... Um, okay, just send that, I gotta, and I gotta meet our people downstairs. Um, the folks that we work with at Alta Machine, they are, are really, um, they're very serious people. Um, and they're, um, ideologically, they're on the same page. You yeah, know? yeah. I talked to Johnny. He seems definitely uh, on the same I page. I love Johnny. Yeah. He's awesome. Um, yeah. So uh, if, if we can figure out some sort of product that is a circuit, yeah. um, it, it can be mass produced. If they can make it, we can, we can be happy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's let's yeah. keep the conversation going. Glad to to talk to you. Yeah. Likewise. Um. Um. Anytime you want to do this again, yeah. and um, um, I'll I'll try to be more active. Uh, should should I like? Is there a mailing list I should join? Is there a way that I should? Uh, there's always email. Group? I'll send you some info on on how to get involved. Awesome. Yeah. But no, yeah. great yeah. stuff. So yeah, let's keep the conversation open. And yeah, thanks for talking. Same. Okay. Bye. Bye.